Hello, and welcome back for this lecture for US 275 Scientific Ethics, where we're going to be taking a look at kind of changing directions a little bit, uh, still focusing in on kind of biomedicine uh, as it relates to uh, the human condition and some ethics associated with it. Uh, but for the next series of lectures, we're going to take a look at different ways in which we can try to kind of uh, attempt to correct damage which has occurred to the body. And so think back to where we talked about how the body works uh, about a week, week and a half ago, uh, where we've got these different cells, different organs within the body that are going to be doing specific things to keep the body alive. Uh, what we're going to be looking at uh, initially here with the organ failure, uh, but then look at cells and potentially stem cells uh, later on uh, in this uh, kind of mini set of lectures, uh, is an effort to kind of go in and kind of restore function uh, that's been disrupted. And so organ uh, failure and transplantation is just going to be one example of that. Uh, so what we're looking at, again, keep in mind uh, how the body works uh, from uh, a week and a half ago, uh, is we've got special structures in the body that are either kind of collections of cells in the form of tissues or distinct organs where we've got kind of clusters of cells, a uh, specialized structure within the body uh, that is going to be doing something that we need. Uh, and what we can see is that if you damage the tissue or you damage the organ, you often result in the loss of function. And so you end up with a, a disease situation or at least harm to the body uh, where it's not working properly. Uh, and this could be uh, the result of a disease process. And so uh, you have a disease uh, like uh, Parkinson's, uh, I think is an example we used uh, early on. Uh, you had the cells within the substantia nigra, uh, within the, the brain stem, the nerve cells. As those cells die, uh, they're going to stop producing dopamine. Uh, and because of that, uh, you're going to see some very dramatic effects uh, within the brains of those individuals uh, that can you know, alter their behavior, and alter the way that they move around. Or uh, it could be uh, the result, damage could be uh, the result of an injury. Uh, and so you can look at you know, potentially a spinal cord injury where a person was in you know, an accident, uh, had trauma to their back, uh, and has damaged their spinal cord and is now paralyzed from the uh, region of the injury uh, down. And so what we're looking at is uh, in this area, we want to try to figure out how it is that we can go in uh, and treat this tissue or organ failure uh, and try to restore function within the body. Now at its simplest level, uh, we can take a look at tissue grafts. Uh, and so with tissue grafts, uh, the idea is that we're going to either replace or compensate for a damaged tissue uh, by putting in kind of replacement tissues. And so we're gonna transfer a portion of the organ, transfer these tissues from another region of the body or from another individual uh, into uh, this patient with the damaged tissues in the hope that these tissues or organs, in this case we're talking tissues, the tissues that we put into uh, the patient uh, are gonna become established and are gonna allow uh, for that individual then to be in a better situation, um, better uh, outcome. Uh, because we've done this transfer of tissues. Uh, and so an example of this, uh, and it's actually a, an organ transplant, we're going to focus on it uh, at this point here, uh, skin grafts are, are going to be an example uh, of a, a tissue or an organ transplant. And so uh, if you have an individually, individually, if you have an individual uh, that's had uh, some type of damage to their skin, you know, it may be a burn, it may be, you know, an accident where, you know, their skin is scraped off, uh, maybe illness uh, that's affected their skin. Uh, the idea is that you go through uh, and take uh, a section of skin uh, off of a, another region of the body. Um, and so uh, you basically kind of dissect it out and take it out. Oftentimes you'll run it through a machine uh, that stretches it and basically makes it almost like a net, uh, makes it meshed uh, so that it can be much larger and stretched out uh, and cover it. Uh, and the idea is that if you uh, implant this, um, this transplant in essence, this transplant will heal normally and reestablish the skin that we want there. Uh, and so what we're looking at um, is either, you know, top layer um, in very large areas like uh, burn patients, or if you take a look at, you know, like uh, treatment of uh, damage to the face skin, uh, you're going to be doing a, a little bit thicker graft, uh, much smaller, 
uh, but it's going to have a much better survival. Um, and so what we're basically doing here uh, is replacing the, the burned, injured, or uh, diseased uh, skin tissue with healthy tissue from another area or another individual and, and trying to repair that damaged region. Organ transplants are, are pretty much the same idea, uh, but as opposed to oops, uh, taking a small section of skin and then you know, suturing it over and letting it heal down here, we're actually taking uh, an intact organ. And a good example of that would be kind of a kidney uh, that we're looking at here. Uh, you're taking a, a complete organ, a complete kidney from one individual uh, and transplanting it into a person that has diseased kidneys. And so in this case, normally we'd have two kidneys kind of in this location here, but now we have a transplanted kidney kind of put in here. And this transplanted kidney is going to take up some of the function that's been lost by these diseased kidneys. And this is a relatively new process. Um, we're going to look at uh, organ transplants, kidney transplants have only been going on uh, for about 70 years, a little less than 70 years. 1954 was the first transplant between identical twins. Uh, and about 10 years later, 1962, so about 60 years ago, uh, it came from a diseased donor. So a patient had died, uh, they harvested the kidney uh, and transplanted it into a recipient, transplanted into a patient that had uh, kidney disease of some type. Uh, and so we're basically looking at these organ transplants uh, as being a relatively new phenomena uh, within medicine. Uh, if we take a look at this, uh, it's estimated uh, in 2018 that there were over 100,000 people in the United States on a waiting list uh, for an organ transplant. And on average, uh, about uh, another name is added on to the waiting list uh, about every 10 minutes. Uh, what's troubling and kind of giving rise to this, this ethical quandary, the ethical dilemma that we're going to be talking about uh, in this series, uh, is that about 20 people every day die because of a lack of available organs uh, for transplantation. Uh, and so again, taking a look at this in 2018, the, the latest data that I was able to find, uh, by and far uh, the most uh, organs transplanted are, are kidneys, uh, then livers, hearts, lungs, uh, and then a variety of other organs and multi-organ uh, transplants going on uh, through here. Uh, but we can see that there's this huge need uh, for organs uh, for transplantation. And so what we need to do is understand a little bit about the biology, uh, about why you can't just, you know, take an organ off the shelf uh, and put it into a patient uh, and have it work uh, the way that you'd want it to do. And so what we're going to talk about um, is the immune system. And so the immune system is going to be a protective mechanism within the body, which is designed or has developed uh, in a way that allows you to, to fight off disease, uh, fight off you know, potential pathogens, disease causing things that may be able to get into the body uh, or foreign materials. And in some cases, they'll recognize like disease cells or cancerous cells uh, as being foreign. Uh, and the way it does it is that it recognizes two specific shapes uh, associated with the molecules that are found on the cells uh, within the organs that we're looking at. And so what we have are these antibodies, this kind of Y-shaped protein here, which is almost like a little construction flag. It's going to bind to specific shapes. And if it binds to something that's going to be harmful to the body, it's going to, to basically, like a construction flag, say, okay, I'm attached to something that's bad, come through, and other cells and other you know, processes within the body are going to come through and eliminate that, hopefully eliminate the disease. And so, uh, again, what we're going to be looking at is going to be these shapes up here, which is going to allow us to kind of understand whether or not our body is going to try to mount an immune response to it and try to fight it off, or it's going to accept it as being kind of a normal part of the body. So if we take a look at the immune system very early on in development and continuing into you know, postnatal, um, you know, your early, you know, up to you know, age 10, up to maybe age 12, uh, your body is going to be learning uh, what is normally found within the body and, and not basically trying to distinguish, it's described as self versus non-self. You don't want to attack your own cells, uh, things like autoimmune diseases like lupus. Uh, you've got a situation where the immune system attacks the body. Rheumatoid arthritis is, is another example of that, uh, and it causes a, a disease state. Uh, you don't want that. What you want is a good, strong immune system that's going to attack the non-self, 
uh, attack these foreign materials, these foreign cells that are going to be potentially, you know, causing disease uh, within the body, recognized as being non-self uh, and eliminated. Uh, but we want to keep our normal body cells protected, and we don't want to mount an immune response against them and try to kill those cells off. Uh, and again, this happens very early on in development. So what we see uh, is, again, based on those shapes, the immune system uh, is going to go through, recognize that non-self, recognize things that are not normally found within the body, uh, and it's going to try to kill these non-self or abnormal cells. And so our immune system then are going to allow us to go in and recognize bacteria and recognize that they shouldn't be in the body and mount a response and try to kill off the bacteria. Uh, cells that are affected by a virus, uh, those virus particles are going to take over the, the kind of control of the cell. They're going to change the appearance of the cell. They're going to change what the cell is going to be doing. Uh, and part of that is going to put specific shapes, specific molecules on the surface of these cells. Our immune system wants to go through, identify these cells infected with a virus and kill them off. Uh, in some types of cancerous cells, again, the, the cells are going to have different molecules, different markers, if you want to think about that along their surface, and the immune system can go through and, and kill those cells off. And so that's good. You know, kill off bacteria that are causing disease, kill off cells that are infected with the virus to keep the virus from spreading, kill off cancerous cells to keep the cancer cells uh, from uh, spreading within the body and causing a much greater disease state. Now, within the last 60, 70 years, we've looked at the ability to transplant cells, tissues, and organs between one individual to the next individual. The immune system isn't built for this, but it's gonna work in this way, in that it's gonna recognize kind of foreign cells, non-matched transplanted cells, in the same way that it recognizes bacteria, viral infected cells, and cancerous cells. And so if we don't have a good match between the donor and the recipient, the recipient's immune system is going to go through and say, okay, this is bad, this is non-self, we're going to kill it off. And you don't want to, you know, be on the donor waiting list, finally get an organ, and then have the organ attacked by your immune system and destroy it. And then, you know, you're as sick or maybe sicker than what you were before. So what we're doing with organ transplantation uh, is this idea that we got to match uh, a donor with the proper recipient. We've got to match it up so that those molecules that are found within the cells, the markers that are found on these cells, uh, are going to match up in a way that we're gonna, not going to mount uh, an immune response. We're not going to kill off the cells that we're going to be using to try to uh, treat these patients. Uh, and so what we're going to see is that we've got an organ procurement and uh, transplantation network. Uh, that's a fancy name for saying we've got a donor registry. Uh, so if you want to trans, uh, serve as an organ donor, they'll go through and they'll maybe collect a sample of your blood, start to analyze kind of what characteristics you have, what markers you have, uh, and use that as a first screen. And so what they do then is within this registry, look at these mar markers, these molecular markers down here, uh, and try to match up the individuals. So in this case, um, this donor uh, is not compatible with this recipient, uh, but it's going to be compatible with this recipient. So we would be able to take organs from this donor uh, and put it into recipient two. In this case, donor number two uh, is not compatible with recipient two, but is going to be compatible with this person here. Uh, and so this donor registry, this organ procurement and transplantation network uh, is going to be matching it up. And so we've got a good uh, kind of collection of molecular markers that says that if we take tissue from this donor and place it into this recipient, this recipient isn't going to be harmed in that process and they're not going to mount an immune response and kill off those cells. Okay, so if we take a look at this, uh, even if we've got a good match, we often have to use anti-rejection medication to suppress the immune response. And so like cyclosporin uh, is an example of this. Uh, it's been approved uh, since uh, the early 1980s. Uh, and this basically kind of turns down or suppresses the immune response uh, within individuals. Uh, it increases the survival of the, the patients that have received the donations, the tissue donations, the organ donations. Uh, but it means that they have a suppressed immune system, which means they could be potentially uh, more susceptible uh, to getting disease. Uh, and so they often you know, try to avoid you know, going out and getting exposed to people that may be uh, contagious. 
Now, if we think about this, uh, bone, do uh, not bone donation, blood donation uh, is going to be similar to a tissue graft, and it is a, a tissue graft. Uh, and so if you take a look at it, uh, this again is going to be a process uh, that's only about 100 years old at this point. Uh, started out uh, in England uh, in 1922, uh, where we had direct blood transfusions from one individual to a next. Uh, in the 1930s, uh, the Mayo Clinic uh, established a way for storing the blood so you could collect the blood uh, in a donation, uh, keep it for a while, uh, and then put it into uh, another patient, uh, recipient in essence. Uh, and then 1940, uh, Charles Drew uh, developed a method to separate, store, uh, and ship blood. Uh, and basically Drew's work uh, basically got us to the point where the American Red Cross now can have a, a blood drive, can collect lots of blood, uh, store it, and then ship it to where uh, it needs to, needs to be going. If we take a look at uh, blood, again, as an example uh, of an organ, we can get an idea about this relationship between the donor and the recipient. And so we've got here a little bit technical, uh, but hopefully uh, I'll be able to explain it uh, so that you can understand it. Uh, but we basically have a, a couple different uh, blood types. Uh, you can have blood type A, blood type B, blood type AB, or blood type O. Uh, and so if we're taking a look at this, what this means is that those patients with blood type A are gonna have red blood cells with little A markers or A proteins along their surface. And so we're representing A proteins or A markers as these little purple popsicles. Uh, so a, a little purple circle on the end of a, a stick here. Group B are gonna have B markers along their red blood cells. And so if we take a look at this, the B are little kind of bluish, um, I guess squares on their end. Uh, and so we've got that. Uh, and so we can see that we've got different markers, different proteins, different molecules on the surface of the blood cells from type A from those with type B. Individuals with type AB are gonna have both the A markers, these uh, kind of purple popsicles, and these kind of greenish bluish uh, squares. So they're gonna have both of these on their surface. Uh, and then we've got uh, group O over here. Uh, individuals with type O blood basically don't have any of these markers. They have other things on their surface, but they don't have the A markers or the B markers, and so they're lacking all of those. Now, keep in mind that what I said is that these individuals, uh, as they develop, are going to want to uh, mount an immune system to those things that are non-cell, uh, mount an immune system that are going to be foreign to them. Uh, and so they're not going to want to produce antibodies against A, because if they did that, it would kill off all the red blood cells and it would not be good. The patient would die. Uh, but they're going to have anti-B antibodies within uh, their body, which means that if they see these B markers, these antibodies are going to attack it, kind of kill off these cells. And, and so again, type B blood in a type A patient uh, is going to be harmful because it's going to cause problems. The patients with type B blood, we said, are going to have type B proteins or type B molecules along their surface, so these kind of greenish blue squares on them. They're not going to have the anti-B antibodies because they don't want to kill off their own red blood cells, but they're going to have the anti-A antibodies. And so if they see the little purple popsicles showing up, they're going to have antibodies. They're going to recognize this is being foreign and attack it. Group AB uh, is a little bit strange because it's got both of these, the purple popsicles and the greenish blue squares on it. They're not going to have any of these antibodies because the A antibodies would attack this, or the anti-B antibodies would attack this, these individuals just have a hard time you know, keeping their blood around if they had those antibodies being present. Uh, and then finally, we've got the, the group O blood over here. They don't have any of these markers. They don't have the purple uh, popsicles. They don't have the greenish blue squares. And so they're gonna have antibodies against A. They're gonna have antibodies against B. Uh, and basically, they're going to attack anything uh, which has either an A or a B on it. Uh, and again, down here at the bottom, we can see the, the proteins that we're talking about. So we've got the purple popsicles are, are described as the A, the greenish blue squares are typed as the B, uh, type AB has both the purple popsicles and the blue green squares uh, if we take a look at it. And so what we can see is the, the different characteristics on these red blood cells are going to give information about you know, the individual uh, that's going to be donating the blood. Uh, this is going to be showing what's going on within their blood, and it's also going to indicate what's going to be going on potentially within the recipient, within their blood. 
Uh, so if we take a look at this, uh, again, move from kind of this kind of biological explanation into uh, the donation uh, and recipient, uh, we again don't want to have a situation where you have these antibodies against it and attacking the, the blood that's going to be coming into it. Uh, and so uh, a type O donor here, if we take a look at what type O means, a type O donor means that they're going to be giving blood that doesn't have any of these uh, molecules, no purple um, popsicles, no greenish blue squares along their surface. So if we take a look at this, this can go into a patient in A, and because it doesn't have, again, if we take a look at it, the patient with A, type A blood, it's going to have the anti-B uh, molecules on it. It's going to attack those B proteins. It doesn't have that, so a person with A is going to be happy and is going to be able to have that blood. Uh, a person with type B is going to be in the situation where it has the anti-A antibodies in it. It's going to be attacking the purple popsicles, but the type O blood doesn't have any purple popsicles on it. Uh, a person with uh, AB blood uh, is not going to have any of these antibodies on it, so they're going to be very good uh, at accepting the blood there. And so what we can see here is that a donation of type O blood isn't going to be recognized as foreign in a patient with A, a patient with B, or a patient with AB. And so a type O blood uh, is going to be uh, a universal donor. A patient with AB blood uh, is going to be what's referred to as a universal recipient. Okay, so if we take a look at that, a person with AB blood is not going to have any of these antibodies present. So they're not going to be attacking A, they're not going to be attacking B, and they're not going to be attacking O. Uh, so basically, these individuals, AB, individuals type AB blood, can accept blood from anybody, in essence, uh, that's going to be donating it. Uh, and then if we take a look at that, type B patients can take B uh, blood uh, from B. Uh, type A patients are going to be able to take uh, blood uh, from A. If you mismatch this, if you've got a, a donor um, going into a patient uh, where we have not a nice red heart, but we got a little grayish purple heart, uh, that's going to be a situation where uh, the patient's antibodies are going to attack the blood uh, it can cause a lot of very harmful problems. It can disrupt the, the circulatory system, it can have clots forming, you can cause kidney failure, and in a very severe uh, extent, uh, you can cause death. And so what we've looked at, again, is a very simple uh, explanation of what we're looking at uh, for uh, kind of matching up a, a donor and recipient. But this is the key idea, uh, and this is what's gonna be done at a much more detailed level to determine whether or not uh, a organ donation can be received by a patient because you don't want them to mount an immune response and, and kill off these cells. Uh, and so that finishes off the first half of this lecture. I'll come back for part two. Where we're going to talk a little bit more uh, about organ donation. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Thank you and have a great day.